In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. St. Louis Marie de Montfort's Prayer to Mary. Hail Mary, beloved daughter of the Eternal Father. Hail Mary, admirable mother of the Son. Hail Mary, faithful spouse of the Holy Ghost. Hail Mary, my dear mother, my loving mistress, my powerful sovereign. Hail my joy, my glory, my heart, and my soul. Thou art all mine by mercy, and I am all thine by justice, but I am not yet sufficiently thine. I now give myself wholly to thee, without keeping anything back for myself or others. If thou still seest in me anything which does not belong to thee, I beseech thee to take it, and to make thyself the absolute mistress of all that is mine. Destroy in me all that may be displeasing to God. Root it up and bring it to naught. Place and cultivate in me everything that is pleasing to thee. May the light of thy faith dispel the darkness of my mind. May thy profound humility take the place of my pride. May thy sublime contemplation check the distractions of my wandering imagination. May thy continuous sight of God fill my memory with his presence. May the burning love of thy heart inflame the lukewarmness of mine. May thy virtues take the place of my sins. May thy merits be my only adornment in the sight of God and make up for all that is wanting in me. Finally, dearly beloved mother, grant if it be possible that I may have no other spirit but thine to know Jesus and his divine will. have no other heart but thine, to love God with a love as pure and ardent as thine. I do not ask thee for visions, revelations, sensible devotion, or spiritual pleasures. It is thy privilege to see God clearly. It is thy privilege to enjoy heavenly bliss. It is thy privilege to triumph gloriously in heaven, at the right hand of thy Son, and to hold absolute sway over angels, men, and demons. <clears throat> it is thy privilege to dispose of all the gifts of God, just as thou wilt. As for my part, other than that which was thine, joyfully without human consolation, to die continually to myself without respite, and to work zealously and unselfishly for thee until death, as the humblest of thy servants. The only grace I beg thee to obtain for me is that every day and every moment of my life I may see, say, Amen, so be it, to all thou didst do while on earth. Amen, so be it, to all that thou art now doing in heaven. Amen, so be it, to all that thou art doing in my soul, so that thou alone mayest fully glorify Jesus in me for time and eternity. Amen. Let us now pray for all the members, both living and deceased. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Mary Immaculate Queen, Good Saint Joseph, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Please be seated. My dear confraternity members, as I had mentioned last month, our plan for this year, that is this school year, September through June, is to go through the little office of the Immaculate Conception, which we pray each day, and to go through, in particular, the hymns. 
and to make sure that we understand what we are saying during these uh, during the recitation of these hymns. Now I'll begin by reading the hymn for the hour of prime. Hail Virgin Most Wise, hail Deity's Shrine, with seven fair pillars and t table divine. Preserve from the guilt which hath come in us all, exempt in the womb from the taint of the fall. O new star of Jacob, of angels the queen, O gate of the saints, O mother of men. O terrible as the embattled array, be thou of the faithful the refuge and stay. Amen. So let us go through stanza by stanza this beautiful hymn that we recite at prime, the second section or second hour, as we call it, of the little office of the Immaculate Conception. So we begin with the words, Hail Virgin Most Wise, Hail Deity's Shrine, Lady, and she was made to be a shrine for the incarnate word who dwelt in her womb for nine months. Now, if you go back in the Old Testament, you can read about the creation, the making of the tabernacle. So the tabernacle was like a movable church, which the chosen people had during their 40 years wandering in the desert. And then later on, Solomon built a temple. But this tabernacle, and then later the temple, were shrines for God to dwell among his people. And it's amazing to read the care with which First of all, Moses in erecting the tabernacle and then later Solomon building the temple, the care with which they fashioned everything that was for the worship of God. So, so what we are saying here is Our Lady is the shrine of the divinity, the deity. Hail deity's shrine. So hail virgin most wise, hail deity's shrine with seven fair pillars and table divine. Now, what does that mean? Seven fair pillars and table divine. It reminds us of a verse in the book of Proverbs. And I will read this quote taken from Proverbs chapter 9. Wisdom hath built herself a house. She hath hewn out seven pillars. She hath slain her victims, mingled her, her wine, and set forth her table. Now, when we speak of Our Lady, and we're speaking about her as being the shrine of the Godhead, our Lord dwelt within her womb, and then we say that there are seven fair pillars, we could apply that to the seven sacraments. Now, the number of seven signifies there are seven gifts of the Holy Ghost, seven sacraments, seven primary virtues, that would be the three theological and the four cardinal virtues, and I'm sure other things that come, don't come to my mind right at the moment, where the number of seven is seen in the Bible and then also in the church. Again, especially the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost and the seven sacraments. So seven fair pillars. And again, quoting from Proverbs, Wisdom hath built for herself a house. Complete. Here I will read says, In the little office of Our Lady, we see how Mary is called by various titles. No tongue can fitly describe her true worth. Neither saint nor angel can be compared to her with her marvelous prerogatives. In her presence, the beauty of the seraphim and the cherubim simply pales. Mary is a resplendent mirror reflecting God's beauty as the surface of a placid lake reflects the splendor of the starry heaven. She 
of him who founded the church with the seven sacraments and the Eucharistic banquet. So seven fair pillars and table divine. Now, when we speak of the seven sacraments, the Holy Eucharist is the greatest of the sacraments because, of course, it contains the very body and blood of Jesus. But we say that um, she has seven fair pillars and table divine. When we use the word table, we're thinking of meal, a banquet, and the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist was instituted to nurture, to nourish our souls. So it is the heavenly banquet. So once again, the first stanza then, Hail Virgin Most Wise, Hail Deity's Shrine, with seven fair pillars and table divine. Our Lady indeed provides the food for this table divine, because she is the one who brought forth Jesus, whom we receive in Holy Communion. Then the next stanza at Prime is, Preserved from the guilt which hath come in us all, exempt in the womb from the taint of the fall. So she was preserved, she alone was preserved from the guilt which hath come on us all. And the privilege of the Immaculate Conception is, we might say, an exception to the rule, because all the children of Adam and Eve, including St. Joseph, including St. John the Baptist, including the greatest saints, the apostles, etc. All were conceived with the stain of original sin on their soul, which is passed down through generation, with our Blessed Mother alone accepted. And this reminds us of the story of Esther. There's a book in the Old Testament called the Book of Esther, and it tells the story of how this very powerful king, Asurus, wanted to choose a queen. And he sent his courtiers out into the kingdom, this vast kingdom. And this was back uh, maybe about 700 years before Christ, when there was the Assyrian Empire. And, and then that was succeeded by the Babylonian Empire. So at one of those was Esther. So these courtiers went out and they chose all these women, these beautiful virgins, and they brought them in so that the king could choose one to be his queen, and he chose Esther. And what he didn't know, and she did not reveal, is that she was a Hebrew. She was a member of the Jewish people. At any rate, an enemy of the Jews prevailed upon the king to pass a decree that on a certain day all the Jews were to be exterminated. And Esther's uncle Mordecai, who had raised her because she was orphaned, told her, God has put you in this position as the queen to intercede for us. And she was afraid. She says, who am I that I can go to the king and ask him to change his decree? And she says, well, get everybody to pray for me. And then finally she went to the king, unasked, uncalled for. She went into his throne room. And there was a decree that nobody could go into the king's throne room that hadn't been called, or they would be put to death. So she went in trembling. And he looked at her, and he loved her, and he said, Esther, this law is not for you. Meaning the law that you couldn't go in without being called. And then second, when he found out that she was a Jew because she asked for the pardon of her people, Again, he said, the law isn't for you, it's for everybody else. So this is a wonderful type of Our Lady. The law of original sin, the sin of Adam and Eve being passed down to all their posterity, is for everybody else, not for Our Lady. So it says here, exempt in the womb from the taint of the fall. Our Lady was the only one exempt from this law of original sin. It's true St. John the Baptist was cleansed of original sin in the womb of his mother, St. Elizabeth. And we believe also that St. Joseph was cleansed like St. John the Baptist of original sin even before his birth, but they were conceived in original sin. So that's why we say here of Our Lady, preserved from the guilt which hath come on us all, exempt in the womb, 
from the taint of the fall. She was exempt, of course, from the very moment of her conception in the womb of her mother, St. Anne. And then we go on in the next verse, the third verse, O new star of Jacob, of angels the queen, O gate of the saints, O mother of men. Now several things we need to reflect here on this third um, stanza. It says, O new star of Jacob. Now what would that refer to? Well, in the Old Testament, if you go back, you remember your Bible history, the chosen people wandered for 40 years in the desert. They are about to enter the promised land. And they went through the territory of a king, and his name was Balak. Now Balak saw this multitude, and he wanted to get a priest to come and curse the Hebrew people, the Israelites. So he sent servants to a man named Balaam. Now Balaam was not an Israelite, but he was a priest of sorts. And so he was called, and Balak said to this priest, Balaam, Now I want you to repeat after me. This people is to be cursed. It said he took him up to a mountain overlooking the camp of all these hundreds of thousands of Israelites. And he said, Repeat after me. And he told Balaam what to say. And Balaam said the opposite. May this people be blessed, etc., etc. And Balak said, no, I told you to say such and such. He says, well, I'm trying to say what you're telling me, but God won't let me say it. And so this priest, Balaam, kept blessing the chosen people. But this is written in the book of Numbers and a story in chapter 24, of, 23 and 24 of the book of Numbers. But what's interesting about it is this man, Balaam, made a prophecy. And the prophecy is well known, and it goes like this. A star shall rise out of Jacob. And he goes on, and a flower shall rise up out of his root. But a star shall rise out of Jacob, referring to the Messiah. So notice what the hymn here calls Our Lady, O new star of Jacob. So it's calling to mind that prophecy of Balaam. It says, Our Lady is a new star of Jacob, of angels the queen. The angels honor Our Lady as their queen. They bow before her. I was speaking with the seminarians the other day about a wonderful painter, artist, named Fra Angelico. You may be familiar with him. He lived in, I think, maybe the 1400s. He was a Franciscan, and he, he painted beautiful religious paintings. But one scene that he really liked was the Annunciation. And he painted several different versions of the Annunciation. Delico's painting, it is the typically uh, pictures the angel Gabriel kneeling before Our Lady. Oftentimes you see the Archangel Gabriel appearing to Our Lady of the Annunciation and he's standing or he's hovering in the air and Our Lady is kneeling there in prayer at the Annunciation. But Fra Angelico shows the angel genuflecting or kneeling before Our Lady because he knew, the Archangel Gabriel knew, Our Lady was their queen. She would be the queen of the angels for all eternity. So that's why we say, O new star of Jacob, of angels the queen. And then we say, O gate of the saints, O mother of men. Our Lady is the gate of the saints, because when you think of a gate, you want to get into an enclosure, you have to go through the gate when it's opened. And Our Lady is like the gate of heaven for the saints. All the saints who get to heaven, they get there through her because she is the mediatrix of all graces. She is the inter intercessor with her divine son. So we call her the gate of the saints and the mother of men. And that's a beautiful uh, stanza here. And that leads us to now, finally, the fourth stanza. O terrible as the embattled array, be thou of the faithful the refuge and stay. Amen. Imagine an army lined up ready for battle, the embattled array. And you have the sun gleaming off all the swords and the shields of all these soldiers. They're lined up in perfect order. What a terrible sight that would be to their enemies. 
when you have a powerful army, well-trained, well-prepared, and a large number. A magnificent array. So Our Lady is like that to the devil. He sees her, he trembles, he flees. She is like this army that is about to conquer him, to break his power over men. So we refer to Our Lady as terrible. Oh, terrible as the embattled array. She is terrible to the enemies of God. They see her, they know her power. It's interesting, you read in the, in the Secret of the Rosary, St. Louis Marie de Montfort tells a story of a couple of cases of possession where the devil was driven out of someone through the power of the rosary. And the priest, on one occasion, was St. Dominic, but the priest asked the devil, who is your greatest enemy? And he didn't want to say it. And the priest forced him to say it. And he trembled and says, well, if I have to say the truth, then you Christians listen up and listen carefully. It is the Holy Mother of God who is our implacable enemy. She constantly defeats us. We can't win when she enters. It is terrible as an army set in array for the enemies of God, for the devils and all the enemies of God. And then we conclude, be thou of the faithful, the refuge and the stay. So Our Lady is a refuge. We flee to her. And she's also like the stronghold where we remain safe. And then finally, we conclude each um, of the hymns at each hour with a versicle and a response. And the one at prime is, the Lord himself created her in the Holy Ghost. And the response is, and poured her out among all his works. Now that's a very interesting statement. He poured her out. What does that mean? It means that our Lord wishes to share Our Lady with all mankind. She is given to all of us to be our mother, our spiritual mediatrix of grace, and our model, our intercessor. So the little office is certainly beautiful, but let us reflect upon these various verses as we pray them. And always remember that Our Lady was uniquely created by God to be the mother of his divine son, the mother of the Redeemer. And she is also our spiritual mother. Let us honor her as such. St. Louis Marie de Montfort. Gratitude before thee for the grace thou hast bestowed. Alas, O Lord, I am so wretched. that she may appease thy just wrath, because I have so often offended thee, that she may save me from the eternal punishment of thy justice, which I deserve, that she may contemplate thee, speak to thee, pray to thee, approach thee, and please thee, that she may help me to save my soul and the souls of others. In short, Mary is necessary for me, that I may always do thy holy will, and seek thy greater glory in all things. Ah, would that I could proclaim throughout the whole world the mercy that thou hast shown to me. Would that everyone might know I should be worthy thanksgiving for so great a blessing. 
Mary is in me, O oh, what a treasure, O oh, what a consolation, and shall I not be entirely hers, O oh, what ingratitude. My dear Savior, send me death rather than such a calamity, for I would rather die than live without belonging entirely to Mary. With St. John the Evangelist at the foot of the cross, times for my own, and as many times have given myself to her. But if I have not yet done it, as thou, dear Jesus, dost wish, I now renew this offering, as thou dost desire me to renew it. And if thou seest in my soul or my body anything that does not belong to this august princess, I pray thee to take it and cast it far from me, for whatever in me does not belong to Mary is unworthy of thee. O Holy Ghost, grant me all these graces. Plant in my soul the tree of true life, which is Mary. Cultivate. to Mary, thy faithful spouse. Give me great confidence in her maternal heart and an abiding refuge in her mercy, so that by her thou mayest truly form in me Jesus Christ, great and mighty, unto the fullness of his perfect age. Amen. The Fatima prayer is, my God, I believe, I adore, I trust, and I love thee. And I beg pardon for those who do not believe, do not adore, do not trust, and do not love thee. My God, I believe, I adore, I trust, and I love thee. And I beg pardon for those who do not believe, do not adore, do not trust, and do not love thee. My God, I believe, I adore, I trust, and I love thee. And I beg pardon for those who do not believe, do not adore, do not trust, and do not love thee. O most holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, I adore thee profoundly. I offer thee the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, present in tabernacles throughout the world, in reparation for the outrages, sacrileges, and indifference by which he is offended, by the infinite merits of the sacred heart of Jesus, in union with the immaculate heart of Mary, I beg the conversion of poor sinners. O most holy Trinity, I adore thee. My God, my God, I love thee in the most blessed sacrament. O my Jesus, it is for love of thee, in reparation for the offenses committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary and for the conversion of poor sinners. Jesus, meek and humble of heart, make our hearts like unto thine. St. Louis Marie de Montfort, St. Philomena, Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patri, Sit Fidi, et Spiritus Sancti, Descendat Supervos, Admoniat Semper. Amen.